Hello and welcome to this last lecture in this course, System Administration Guam. Today we have a guest speaker, Marcus Wilhelmsson. Hi everyone. From CLX Communications. Uh, and he will talk uh, first a bit about CLX, the company that we're working, and then his road towards DevOps. Yeah, ish. DevOps ish. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I thought I would start with a little bit about myself. Uh, like Jakob said, my name is Marcus Wilhelmsson, and I am the head of operations. Which means I, I lead the operations team in our daily ventures and uh, try to make everything at CLX Networks or CLX Communications. I will talk a little bit about why I have a CLX Networks address instead of a CLX Communications address in a little bit. But there's my mail address if you by any chance would like to mail me at some point. But I would like to start to talk about CLX as a company, who we are and where we fit or how we, we fit in the value chain. Uh, my guess is that none of you has heard of CLX networks or CLX communications for that matter, ever. Uh, we are a company in the communications business and our main focus is messaging. Text messaging, SMS, call it whatever you want. That's our main focus. We also have services including voice, uh, different types of information services regarding messaging and voice. And we also have our newest or latest product which includes IoT connectivity, which basically is a SIM card that you can use for data or messaging or voice or whatever you want. Uh, the thing is, when it comes to messaging, I thought I would focus a little bit on that. Uh, most people tend to think that messaging is just send an SMS and you're done. That's not quite the case. It's like we used to say. It's uh, organized like uh, a can of worms. There are so many different uh, technologies for doing the same thing. So what we do is that we provide an API for enterprises, that is our customers, where, uh, which they can use to send SMS messages. And they will send these to us and we will then in our turn route them out to uh, different networks, uh, mobile networks. So we're kind of, even though it's the wor uh, uh, wrong word, we're the man in the middle in all of this. Um, so basically what we do is that we, we take all this complicated stuff and make it easy for other companies to, to use it. Um, and uh, I mentioned our service portfolio, we have messaging, we have voice, we also have inbound numbers, which you can rent, I guess. This is really not my main area <laughs> at CLX. I, I do the, the background business when it comes to managing servers and stuff like that. So this is kind of a uh, little bit deep for me. But we, we have inbound numbers, local virtual numbers, which you can use for either voice or messaging as a customer. We have the IoT connectivity uh, service, where you can, uh, I don't know, you can manage your SIM card or SIM cards uh, through an API. We have number lookup services, which basically are big databases with phone numbers and uh, if your country has number portability, which we have in Sweden, uh, you can send a question in with a uh, phone number and uh, get an answer back uh, that tells you which mobile operator has this number at the moment. 
So even though you have information that this number series is owned by, let's say, Telia, you still have to check, is this, owned by, uh, is this still a Telia number or has it been ported to like Telia 2 or something? Uh, and that's what this number lookup service is all about. And we also have managed services where you basically have your, your own copy of our communications platform. If you're into that sort of thing, so you can become like <laughs> almost a, a virtual version of CLX within our, uh, our system. Uh, we power many businesses. So we have a lot of different customers which use our services. Uh, and this is just an axe pick. Can you say an axe pick in English? <laughs> Go for it. Yeah. Uh, this is just a small number of the, the, the different kinds of services uh, or different kinds of businesses that use our services. Um, and you can also see number of customers here down at the bottom. I don't, since this is not the main focus of the lecture, I will just go ahead and <laughs> click, click away. Uh, right now we have, uh, well, I forgot to mention that since I think I was a little bit too fast. Um, the thing that I've been talking about now, that's CLX networks. Within the company, we also have SimSoft, which uh, it's a company that it's a software company that builds the SMSC, the software that uh, routes the SMS traffic. So th uh, they have uh, a number of different platform. Uh, sorry, they have over 70 platform installations, and these are some of the customers uh, that use their platform. So it's being used by a number of customers. These are just a few examples. And we as a company, CLX Networks, we have um, over 100 direct connections with mobile operators where we can send uh, SMS messages. And this is also just a few of those. Um, this is our geograph geographic footprint where we have offices. And this is both for CLX Networks and SimSoft, the maker of the SMSC software. But CLX Networks, we have uh, here in Kalmar, uh, and we have in Stockholm, which is the uh, company headquarters, and we also have a number of sales offices around the world. And this, uh, it's, I mean, it's just numbers, this. Um, uh, we have around $130 million run rate revenue and profitable. I have no idea what that means. It's economics stuff. I guess it's good. I don't know. <laughs> it's really not what I do. Uh, we're listed on the Nasdaq Stockholm main market. So we're, uh, we're a publicly traded company. And at the moment we have, I guess it's probably a little bit more than 190 employees throughout the world. And the company as a whole exists, uh, we consist uh, out of two different divisions, which is CLX, where I work, and SimSoft, that does the software solutions. They offer platform as a service. Uh, and uh, we, of course, use their software and in our business. And I guess this is for you uh, who have seen this, a presentation from CLX before. You've seen this picture before. Um, should say development, but the T is kind of fallen down a bit. Uh, this is the CLX uh, staff here in uh, Kalma. So we have a number of developers, eight developers, eight in support, four in operations. I would say three, but well. Uh, and we also have a number of developers in 
uh, Montreal. But right now, Kalmar is the, it's about on par with the number of people employed here in Kalmar and the HQ in Stockholm. But in Kalmar, we have the development support and operations business. So what we do is that we, we develop the platform uh, which supports the business. We support all our customers and also support towards uh, operators. We make sure everything works in operations where I work. Uh, but we don't have any salespeople here. It's, it's only the, the, the technical stuff. And now to the fun stuff, what we do. What we do in operations, what tools we use, and our journey the last couple of years. Uh, these are some of the technologies that we use. I don't know if you've used any of them. I'm sure you have all used Vagrant. Yep. You've all used Git. Uh, you've all used a Mac, maybe, almost. Most of you have used Mac. Um, and you've been in contact with, well, maybe not CentOS, but you've used some, some Linux distribution, at least. Um, and what I would like to do now is to take you on kind of a journey into my head. This is uh, what we do at operations and the tools we use, use and why we have chosen to use these tools. So I, I'm calling this the operations journey uh, or like uh, Jakob said, DevOps-ish. <laughs> we're not fully there yet but we're working on it. Uh, so the agenda for today is an overview. What do we do? Then I will talk about co provisioning and configuration management. How do we configure our servers? And why do we do it in that way? And the first thing I can tell you is that we don't do it manually. Then I will talk about monitoring then authentication and access control, auditing and central log management. Uh, I will round off with metrics, which is dear to me. I love metrics. I love all of this, but operation, operations for me is my, my sweethearts. That's monitoring and metrics. That's what I love. What I love. Um, but you still have to have the other parts to have a, a functioning uh, system. I think. Um, so let's start what, with what we do, and I, I call this the DevOps pitch. So what's DevOps? I, I know you've all heard the, the word DevOps before. Uh, I think it's even in the description of the program itself. Uh, and I know you will hear even more about it in the, in the coming years. Uh, when you continue your education here. Uh, but you can kind of nail it down to three different uh, topics. It's the collaboration of people, collaboration between development and operations in, uh, for the main part. It's about the convergence of process we can't continue to do stuff like we've always done. We have to change to get this smoothly, uh, do this transition smoothly. And it's about the creation and exploitation of tools. And that's what I will be talking about mostly today. And maybe someday I will be back and talk a little bit about the other two. So the primary goal for us in operations is to provide quality and reliability to our customers. And that's usually the, the case for most businesses. That's what you want. Uh, and to do this, we have to make sure that all our systems are up and running and that they are configured in the manner that we want them to be configured. 
So the main goal for us is to be all-powerful, all-seeing and all-knowing. And we can't be all-powerful, all-seeing and all-knowing without the use of certain tools which helps us with this. Otherwise you would have uh, one employee for each serv server just making sure that it was running and that all services were running as they uh, are supposed to and so on and so on. So we need a number of tools to make sure that this, these goals are fulfilled or as fulfilled as possible. And the first thing that we need to focus on, that's provisioning and configuration management. For us, configuration management is mandatory. Okay. <laughs> there are too many MacBooks. Um, and what that means is that you don't log into a server and configure stuff manually. You don't do it. It's chance to fail. <laughs> well, almost. Uh, and the reason for this is that every time you log on to a server, yourself as root or super user, admin, call it whatever you want, uh, that system will be in an unknown state to everyone else. They don't know what changes you've made. And when they, the rest of the team, or the rest of the company, or the rest of the world, doesn't know what changes you've made, then it's very hard to find problems, if you have a problem, or make assumptions about the system when it comes to performance and stuff like that, if you don't know how it's configured. So what you do is that you use a configuration management uh, system. We have chosen Puppet for various reasons, mostly because our colleagues in Canada already used Puppet, so it was kind of an easy choice to make since they already had the knowledge and we could learn from them. Um, and this is it's, it's quite simple really, it's infrastructure as code. So instead of configuring everything manually, you write it as code. And then you, when you log, in, log into the server, you basically, either you log into the server, run a program, press enter, or you have an agent in the background updating the configuration, let's say once half an hour or something like that. And you have a central server with all the configuration uh, in it, so-called puppet master. And to, I mean, you don't want to edit all the configuration on the Puppet Master. That's, that's also really, really stupid. What you want to do is that you want to have uh, versioning in some way, and we use Git for that. So we have a number of different branches, one for staging maybe, where you can test your code or whatever you want uh, with non-production machines, and then you merge that into the master branch where you have your production code. Uh, so that's how we work uh, with configuration management. And I think that you will have a course later on. Yes, uh, we will have a course in uh, configuration management in the last year. Yeah. The first course in the, the last year. So not this autumn, but the next one. Yeah. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that this is the way to go, uh, and it doesn't matter if you're aiming for a, a career as me, as an operations guy, or if you want to be a programmer, you still have to know this stuff. More and more companies are seeing the power of using configuration management, and the great thing is that if you, as a potential developer, know how to use configuration management, you can have a much, much greater influence on how the servers are configured because you yourself, you can check out the new branch and do your tweaks, change the service in the way that you want. Maybe you don't have the right to merge it into production, but you can still come up with really great solutions when it comes to how to configure the server without having the uh, the access to really, really put it in place 
on the production systems, but you, you, you can still uh, collaborate with operations people in a really, really nice way. So this is, this is kind of the heart of the system. Uh, everything that we will uh, talk about after this is configured through, in our case, Puppet. But you can also use something else like Chef or Ansible or Salt or whatever you want. They are pretty similar. So if you know one of them, it's, it's easy to, to, to switch uh, if the place where you, are, you end up are using one of the other tools. Uh, okay. It, as, as, as always, I talk a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, but like I said, we use Puppet for configuration management, and today we use we use three three different components to 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 have this up and running. Uh, to start with, we have Puppet itself. And like I mentioned earlier, we have Git, and we also have something called Librarian Puppet. And Librarian Puppet is just, it's just because it's, it's easier to manage Puppet if you use Librarian. Puppet itself, it's built up out of your own code and probably a lot of code that you haven't written yourself, so-called modules. So let's say you want to set up an Apache web server. And if you want to set up an Apache web server, you don't want to write the whole configuration needed for setting up this uh, Apache server yourself. But you use a module. Someone else has written a module where you can just put in the configuration that you want like paths and virtual hosts and so on. And uh, these modules, there are a lot of them, thousands of them for different applications. They are managed by librarian Puppet. Uh, so we have our modules at the top. That's kind of the code that you haven't written. Uh, we also have what we call site modules. That's kind of something that not all people use, but we use. So basically, it's a site module is a file that ties together a number of different external modules. So let's say you want to configure a web server. Then you have, maybe you have a site modu module called LAMP where you can configure all the Linux stuff, you can configure all the Apache stuff, all the MySQL stuff, and you install PHP, all in the same module. So in the attribute file, which is tied to the server, where you say this server should have this configuration, this configuration, this configuration, you can just put in the site module, and that will make this server configured with all the stuff that you have in the site module without you having to call the different uh, modules separately. So you have like, what should I call it? It's like, it's a, it's like a collection of, of configuration, um, more, more like a function maybe. So you have, uh, let's say you have a database server where you want to have MySQL or MySQL. But you also want monitoring for this server installed automatically. Then you can put all that in a site module and it will do both of them without you having to call a number of different modules. Uh, and we also use two uh, decide which server should have what configuration. We use YAML files. I don't know, have you you, you, you all know of JSON, XML? Yeah, well, but, but it, it's, it's another one of those. Uh, it, it's, it's a way to, to structure and order data, basically. Um, so in our daily operation, we have a Puppet Master, where we uh, pull down all the 
different information that we need we, from uh, our internal Git repositories. We pull down the external modules. Everything is collected down to the Puppet Master. So the Puppet Master has the kind of the, the, the all-seeing, all-knowing role in this case. And then we have Puppet Agents. Uh, Puppet Labs, who have uh, developed Puppet, they usually say that you should have your puppets run once every 30 minutes. I don't trust myself, so I run it manually, uh, which has saved me a number of times where I thought I had everything right, but I didn't. So instead of having uh, all of my servers misconfigured, I only had one, which was a little bit easier to solve. Uh, so I don't trust myself. Uh, you need a much, much bigger apparatus for finding bugs in your puppet configuration if you use uh, uh, automatic puppet runs. Uh, we have a production and a staging environment. Staging is for testing. Production is for production. Um, and usually when I develop uh, my puppet code, I do it on local Vagrant machine or local Vagrant machines. So I, I run everything locally without a puppet master. Which is both easy and, uh, well, I don't, I don't interfere with, with, with the other servers. So it's, 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 it's quite, a, quite a nice way to do it, I think. Any questions so far? Nope. Now I just have to make sure that I don't talk about monitoring for like two hours and we run out of time. Um, when it comes to monitoring, we use Sensu. We used to run a service or a program called Savix, but it became more and more painfully clear that Savix doesn't scale very well. Um, it uses MySQL at the bottom, which doesn't scale very well. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, you, you can't really have an, an HA high availability solution with Sabix without having a lot of compromises. So we, well, it's still Sabix. We haven't ditched it fully yet because we haven't moved over all the functionality to sensor. But most of the functionality has been moved over. And uh, so far, I'm happy. I hope my colleagues are happy. They haven't said anything to, to, to contradict my statement that it's, it was a good move. Uh, sensor itself is free and open source. It's written in Ruby. And I don't know if any one of you is that into monitoring yet, but it's, I would more call it an alarm router than a, a monitoring tool because it's, it's, it's built uh, on, a, on a microservices uh, way of thinking. Um, so all components are puppet managed, of course. All components are also written in Ruby almost, not the ones that we have written ourselves, which tend to be written in Go instead of, of, of Ruby. Uh, it, utilizes, it utilizes a transport layer, which is basically the only connection between the sensor servers and the sensor clients down on the monitor machines. They all talk to the, the transport layer, and the transport layer is RabbitMQ. It's a message, message queuing transport layer. And today it consists of three clustered RabbitMQ servers. And at the back end for storing uh, data regarding which state servers and services are in, we use Redis. Uh, and if you ask me, this is easy to maintain. You have uh, a clear defini definition on the borders between the different components. It's easy to scale. If you need more RabbitMQ servers, 
stuff are starting to go a little bit slow, you can just add more to your cluster. Instead of having a, a three server cluster, you can have a five server cluster. And to be honest, the utilization today on the RabbitMQ cluster is really, really low. So you need a lot of servers and a lot of checks to even begin having some sort of load on, on, on that layer. And then when it comes to the sensor servers, you can just add more. They are totally independent. And if one goes down, it, it doesn't matter. Right now we have two of them. And they are also not very utilized. And the last part, the Redis data storage. Add more Redis servers. It's not harder than that. And, oops. This is kind of the, 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 the basic, this should really be uh, an animated uh, GIF. But since uh, uh, PowerPoint, <laughs> PowerPoint doesn't like animated GIFs, so uh, I, I, so, so, some parts here like the API, which is like gray, grayed out, and we have another client down at the left, which is also grayed out. And we just have to imagine those not being grayed out. So this works by, like the, the, the client itself, that's totally uh, autonomous. The client operates, it does its own checks, and sends all that information. Uh, if it's zero, it's okay, if it's one, it's a warning. If it's two, it's, it's a critical error. And three and everything above, that's just unknown. And it sends this information along with a lot of other information that's generated by the sensor client uh, to the transport layer. And it will sit on the transport layer until one of our Redis servers consumes that data. So it just picks one after another the messages being sent to RabbitMQ and looks at it. Okay, so this is an alarm which has state one, which is warning. Okay, what should I do when I get a warning message? Okay, I should run this script. Let's do that and send that information to that script. And that script might send me an email or it maybe it posts on Slack. We have a number of different Slack channels where you have different types of alarms. Uh, maybe it's not in a, even an alarm. Maybe it's a metric that's being sent instead. Okay, let's send that metric to another script, which in turn sends it to Graphite, which we use for uh, metrics. So it's this part here, the server, it's not that much of a server, it's more of a router. So it routes the information that it receives from the RabbitMQ transport layer to uh, different handlers, which could mean, yes? We have one question. What, yep. What's a metric? Um, <laughs> a metric, uh, that's uh, information on, let's say, how many requests you have per second or something like that. So it, it's, it's not something that you take an action on. It's more for graphing. You want to historically see how the system is doing. And that's what you use metrics for. So it's more like statistics. <coughs> uh, so if you, if you, let's say you have a web server, maybe you want to see how many requests per second are we getting from the internet towards this web server. Okay, we have in, in, in our mean value is in, in the last 30 minutes is a thousand per second, maybe. So you want that kind of information to see over time how the server is doing, what kind of load you have on your server, how many requests you're serving and so on. Uh, and it also sends this information up to Redis. And the reason for that is because the API talks to Redis. And we have another box over here. Uh, can they see what I kind of point on the, on, on the, yeah. So we have another box over here, which is the web interface for this. 
which, which is called Uchiwa. Uh, and Uchiwa is connected to the API. API is connected to Redis and kind of search Uchi serves Uchiwa with the information about how all the systems are doing. Which, which services are in a warning state, okay, that will be displayed on our console at the office and so on. So that's the basic layout of our monitoring system. Um, we have, like I said, we haven't written this ourselves. It, it's, it's free and open source. We have written one component ourselves and that's written in Go. And that's one of, one of the handlers. Remember I talked about handlers, they can send you email or send you an SMS or send to Slack or something like that. And uh, we wanted a handler where we in the puppet code could tag stuff. So we, we, we want to tag, tag the checks that we do down here on the clients. We want to tag that with custom information. Uh, and then we have uh, this program that we've written called Newman after the post guy in Seinfeld. <laughs> uh, he looks, or he, it looks at the information that we have specified in our clients and uh, looks at uh, its own configuration about which users should have which information and in that way you can, in a sense, uh, you can, I just have to find the word. Subscribe to tags. So you as a user can subscribe to different tags. Maybe you're interested only in alarms when our supplier connections, that's connections to other, to mobile operators, when those are down or one of them is down or you have a problem with those, maybe that's the information you need. But if our, uh, I don't know, web server is running out of disk space, you're not interested in that. That's something that should only go to operations. Then operations will subscribe to that tag. So that's kind of the, the basic thought behind that system. Uh, and that's not open sourced yet. I'm, I'm aiming towards uh, hopefully releasing that to the public, but it's too much spaghetti code still. <laughs> Yeah, it's, 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 maybe it has one or two hard-coded values that we don't want to release to the public. Um, but hopefully we, we, we will do that one day. Um, and we can take any further questions on the monitoring part uh, at the end of the, the lecture or talk. Um, the next part is about authentication and access control. It's boring, but you need it. And I don't know how much you've talked about. You have, you have, you have used the Active Directory, I guess? Yes, we talked yeah. about it. Uh, they haven't done any exercises on it yet, but yeah. they know some of it. They know the basic concept of central user management, at least. Yeah. So uh, Active Directory and, in our case, Free IPA uses a protocol called LDAP. That's industry standard. Use it. If you think you should use something else besides LDAP, don't. You should use LDAP only, period. Okay, free IPA uses Kerberos as, as well, but let's not talk about that. Um, we have four free IPA servers in total in a master, master replica cluster. So basically three out of four servers can go down and we're not affected unless the service that is contacting free IPA is written by, by someone a little bit less intelligent, uh, where you only can specify one server. Then we have a problem if the, if the first server goes down. Uh, all client access is done uh, via simple SSL. That is, it's encrypted with SSL. Um, and another pro tip from me, don't allow anonymous access to your LDAP servers, ever. Don't do it, it's stupid. You, sh you should never do it, period. Um, 
and the reason for this is that uh, you can you can list all the all the information in your directory without having to log in, which as you as you can hear is very very stupid. Uh, there are a number of different LAP servers you can choose from if the company where you end up working uses Active Directory. That's fine. That's a very competent LDAP server and authentication and access control server in, in general. It, it works fine. We use FreeIPA, which is a little bit more aimed towards Linux. Since we only have Linux servers, it doesn't make any sense for us to use uh, uh, this kind of service on, on Windows. It just complicates things. And free IPA is developed by Red Hat, so, and we use CentOS, which is basically Red Hat without the Red Hat brand on it. So it, it fits like a glove, works really well. Um, we used to run OpenLDAP before we switched to free IPA. OpenLDAP works fine, but it doesn't integrate as well with the system. It works fine when it comes to user, user authentication. So you can log in using your uh, username and password, just like you do here at the university. But we have a number of different stuff that works even better when we use free IP. For instance, you can have your SSH key, public key, uploaded to the central server, and it can be used on, on all the uh, free IP clients. And you can, it's much easier to have a ma uh, central uh, management of sudo. I don't know, you've talked about sudo? Yes. Yes. Um, and so on. So uh, user and group management, that's done through free, free IPA for almost all services. We have a couple of services which doesn't have LDAP support, unfortunately. Um, but everything that has LDAP support uses it. You should also use RBAC, role-based access control. Uh, you can define a number of roles, roles in your LDAP system, usually. You can have operations, maybe, which means you have access to pretty much everything. Like, you know, we're all-knowing, all-seeing, and all-powerful. So if you're part of the operations role, uh, then you have, well, basic all system access. If you're in a support role, maybe you have uh, access to a number of systems. Maybe you can restart a number of services if you have problems with them. So support can do that themselves without involving operations. But you can, for instance, log, log in as root, uh, run puppet, stuff like that. Uh, if you're in sales, you don't have access to the servers at all, but you have diff uh, access to other services. Maybe you have access to, uh, I don't know, the where, where, where you document stuff, the d documentation system, that's uh, one of the things that you need access to, the intranet if you have one of those, and so on and so on. So my, 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 uh, my thought in, on this is use RBAC. It's, it's good for you <laughs> and everyone else. Um, I don't know, do you usually take a break around this time? Or? Yes, we usually do. Yeah. Uh, how much do you have left? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I can be done in 15 minutes. Uh, I can also be done in 50 minutes if that's preferred. I can talk a lot. We have a, we have a number of different topics that that we we will talk about. So, how, I, I think I think 15 minutes or 10 minutes or something right now that that okay. would be nice. We take a 10 minute break. Yeah, great. Welcome back. Uh, we have two topics left to talk about. The first one is central logging, and then we have metrics. And uh, I thought I would start with central logging. Uh, all servers, all systems for that matter, they generate logs. 
a lot of logs. And to be able to correlate and analyze these logs, you need to have a central log management system. Uh, if you don't, you have to log into maybe three, four, five, ten different servers and start, and you, you, you have to kind of correlate, correlate the logs between the two servers or three servers or four servers and then you realize that, oops, the time on one of the servers is off by two minutes because you haven't been able to use the, the time sync feature. Okay, so when I look at the logs here, I have to, I'm looking for this, but on the other server, I have to look one minute and 57 seconds ahead, and it's, it's, it's just a mess. So uh, you want a central logging system where you send all your logs. And we have this in place. We use a free and open source project called Greylog, which is uh, developed by well, originally a, a couple of German guys, which are extremely helpful when it comes to, to, to helping you using this system. So I've had a contact with them a number, number of time, uh, times, and they've always helped me to solve the problems that I've had. So I can really recommend it. The system itself is written in Let's have a guess. Not Ruby. Your favorite language. Javascript. J oh, almost JavaScript. Java. <laughs> I, I, I was a little bit sarcastic. <laughs> well, in, the, in this case, it works really well. <laughs> uh, so you have uh, um, kind of a, a, a main system core in, written in Java. And we have two of those for failover high availability reasons. Uh, then you have uh, databases, one to store the log messages and one to store all other kinds of settings. Uh, all other kinds of settings are stored in MongoDB and uh, the uh, logs themselves are stored in a, an, an Elasticsearch cluster. I don't know, have you, no. But you, you, you've heard of MongoDB? Well, some of you have. Uh, and of course, this is LDAP. It's LDAP uh, to log in, and it's all managed by Puppet, both MongoDB, Elasticsearch, and Greylog itself. And the Greylog guys, they provide Puppet modules, so you don't have to write all the configuration yourself. So it's, it's quite easy to get up and running. Uh, I think right now we have around, I think, f around 400 million lines of logs before the, the old logs are kicked out. So we, we use uh, uh, log rotation based on number of logs, not based on time, because I don't want to try to predict uh, the space the logs will take. Uh, because you always have to, since, since I use Elasticsearch, and Elasticsearch in this case consists of three Elasticsearch servers uh, where I have kind of a high availability setup where one of the servers can be down without losing any data if that server goes down. I have a policy set that all logs should always be present on two servers at the same time. So then you have uh, the servers on, uh, or sorry, the logs on that third server, and when that goes down, the other two servers will start copying logs in between them to make sure that the logs are on two servers. And because of that, you need uh, a lot of free disk space if that were to happen. And you can do a number of things in Greylog you can receive logs. Whoa. Uh, all, all our uh, servers, they send just ordinary syslog messages, uh, which the R syslog daemon in, in Linux takes care of. I just set, send everything to that IP. 
and that IP in this case it is the high availability IP which is shared between the two servers, the two Greylog servers. So if one of the Greylog servers goes down, I use a service called Keep Alive D, which moves the IP to the other server. And then when the, the first server comes back up, the IP is moved back. Um, so I don't, uh, at the moment we don't use any uh, load balancer in front of it, but you can do that if you have a very large number of logs. Um, and then when you receive the logs, you can receive them via syslog, either via TCP or UDP. Uh, we also use a format called GELF, Greylog Extended Log Format, which we use in all our internally written applications that our developers develop they use the GELF format for sending logs in. It's a little bit more flexible than the uh, syslog format. And we also send in SNMP traps, which I guess most of you don't know what it is. No, uh, SNMP is a protocol called, uh, well, it stands for S uh, Simple Network Management Protocol. So m most uh, network switches and routers and stuff like that have support for SNMP. So we, uh, in our case, it's a number of different uh, services that only has SNMP support. They, when they detect something wrong within themselves, let's say a fan is failing or something like that, they will send that information, information using a trap to our Greylog system. So we have a lock log of it. And if we have certain logs or maybe we have too few logs, we can send out an alert. So let's say we have a good case would be our billing system, which runs continuously all the time, making sure that we, we get paid. And so it analyzes the, the, the data from the SMSs and the, the, the calls and everything that goes through our systems. And if we don't have certain uh, phrases logged uh, within a certain interval, we know that there's something wrong with the billing. The billing doesn't run, the billing has stopped for some unknown reason. So it kind of, it checks in once every I don't know how often it is, I don't have that number in my head, but it, with a certain interval it checks in and sends a log message. I'm, I'm done with this, I'm starting with this. And uh, if we don't get those messages, we get an alarm. So it's, it's really quite simple. So you can, you, can do, you can do alerting on the number of logs or certain phrases of logs, you can use regular expressions and uh, you can send uh, alarms uh, via mail. You can use a, you know, some sort of HTTP callback to an API, or like we do, we have installed a Slack plugin, so we get the the, the uh, alerts via Slack. Uh, so, so do, do I get you right that? The gray log system det detects the errors and sends them to, to the server you talked about. Sensor? No. No? The, the server I talked about. Yeah, or the, um, uh, you, sent, you sent alert to the router that routed the... the uh, yeah, those are two totally different systems. Okay, so, so, yeah. So, uh, gray log in this case does not go through the sensor alarm router. Uh, I guess maybe you could do that, but that would probably require a sensor plugin to Greylog because uh, the sensor API, which you would have to use, that expects uh, a certain JSON string. Uh, and I guess it would be quite easy to write such a plugin because you have really good plugins supporting Greylog. Uh, the Slack support is a, is a plugin and the SNMP support is also a plugin. So I wouldn't be surprised if someone's already done it. I just haven't checked. Um, and I think, um, like I said, we have around 400 million logs 
uh, which is maybe like a month worth. And we're usually somewhere between 50 and let's say four or 500 log messages a second into the system. Sometimes when a service decides that it has a lot of problems and wants to tell us about it a lot, we can have a couple of thousand uh, incoming messages per second. It, it really depends. But the, so far it's been able to handle it very well. And if you need more, more power in, in when it comes to Greylog, uh, you can always put uh, a load balancer in front of it. Uh, uh, and then you, you, you can route the messages through a number of different Raylog servers with round robin or something. Uh, yes? Uh, but the, the logging system and the monitoring system are not connected in any way? Mm, well, no, the Raylog system or the logging system and the, the monitoring system, they are, not co they are not dependent on each other. The monitoring system monitors the logging system to make sure that it's up and running. But they're, they're not depending on each other in any way. So if the monitoring system would be down, which shouldn't happen, <laughs> uh, then uh, Greylog wouldn't be affected. But if Greylog goes down, the monitoring system would uh, shout at me and say, yeah, do your work, exactly. <laughs> and the last thing that I thought I would talk about is metrics. Metrics is fun. And my motto is, if it moves, graph it. Uh, if needed, alert on it. Uh, and to handle metrics, which are usually sent in by Sensu, uh, not in all cases. Uh, our internal applications that we develop ourselves and also some external applications that we use, mainly open source applications, they have Graphite support. So Graphite is kind of the core to handle our metrics. Uh, it's really, really simple. This is how you send data into a Graphite si uh, server. You echo a string with something dot something dot whatever you want which creates kind of a tree structure with the dots as the separators you send in a value in this case case 20 could be whatever you want as long as it's, as it's numeric and then you have a uh, epoch or unix date thingy you know i don't know have you Basically, it's the number of seconds that has passed since the 1st of January 1970. Uh, so that's what you send in. And in my case, I pipe this through Netcat to my server on port 2003. And it will be handled. Um, but Graphite itself is kind of not so nice to look at. It's kind of ugly and kind of not that easy to use. So if you want it a little less ugly, I wouldn't say beautiful, but still, you use Grafana. It says Grafana here if you don't have a, a white background. Uh, and we, so we use Grafana to graph stuff. Grafana can be used to uh, pull stuff from graphite. But you can also pull stuff from Elasticsearch, which we do. Um, you can pull stuff from InfluxDB, Prometheus, a number of uh, databases that are made for this sort of information, graphing information. And you can uh, have it in a nice uh, user interface. Um, like I said, most of our checks that we do using Sensu, if they can generate uh, metrics, we will send in metrics. So let's say you have a database server. 
uh, in this case MySQL, they tend to generate a lot of metrics, like number of rows read, bytes sent in and out, and slow queries, and God knows what, everything, a lot of stuff. And all that is sent into Graphite, and we then use Grafana to graph it. But we also have a number of systems that we've written ourselves that graphs our traffic data, you know, number of SMS messages sent in per customer and per destination and per network and so on and so on. Uh, which I really can't show you, but I promise it's, it works really well. Uh, and we also have a number of applications, both applications that we've written ourselves and applications that we use for various number, various services that has built-in graphite support. And as long as you have built-in graphite support, you can just set up the graphite server, you FQDN, and send stuff in. Is this only for uh, real-time data? Or nope. is for historical? historical. Yes, ma mainly historical, I would say. So does the data, when you send in the data to, to Graphite, does that store the data? Or yeah. is it another system? Okay. No, uh, Graphite uses a, uh, a server in, in, in the next layer is a server called Carbon. And Carbon uses a file format called Whisper. So basically, in this case, server.cpu would create a file called but first of all, it would create a directory called server, and then a file called CPU, and that uh, file would contain all the information that you send into that kind of that endpoint in in the tree structure. So it's a lot of files. Uh, it's not maybe not the best solution. I've been looking at InfluxDB and a number of other solutions for this because uh, even though they are not graphite they still support this way of sending stuff in so it's basically just a drop-in replacement um, but i you know you know how it is not enough time so i i haven't been able to 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 determine which which uh, service we should use and why and how and so on and so on uh, right now i we have two graphite servers, which handle all our our graphing, and uh, it's it works well, but it's yeah, <laughs> it, it uses quite a lot of resources. the The biggest problem is 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 the disk space, because you said on 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 these. Uh, kind of endpoints in the tree structure, you set something called a retention value. So you say that I would like the resolution of five seconds for five minutes, then I would like the resolution of 15 seconds for one hour, and then I would like 30 minutes for a day, and so on and so on. So when you want, you usually want high resolution in the beginning and then lower and lower. Uh, the further time goes, and they tend to use quite a lot of space because you don't want to run out of space, so it pre-allocates everything. So if it takes like five megabytes, let's say, for this information with the uh, retention value that you've said, as soon as it's created, it will allocate five megabytes. So it uses quite a lot of data. But on the other hand, you know that it won't grow that much at least. Yep. Are you uh, doing some analysis of this data or is it more like, okay, we, this, we could use this for something interesting, so let's store it and, and, and look at it at well, a later stage? Or? And there are a number of reasons why we want this data. The first reason I would say is so that we can look back if we had if we had a problem with something, we want to be able to look back and see when did this happen. Okay, this happened on this server at that time. Let's check the CPU usage and the swap usage and everything else on that server at the same time. So that it's it's mainly for for 
finding problems. Um, but it can also be used in pr proactive, proactively, so that we, we can see that, okay, this server ha has maybe 10 uh, gigabytes, or 10%, let's say 10% uh, storage left. And with the current rate of expanding storage, we, we would need to expand the storage on this server within 21 days. Otherwise, we're screwed. So um, it's, 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 a, it's a tool to both to, to, to find problems, but also to avoid problems and being, ab being able to plan our work ahead. Uh, but the analysis part, you have to do yourself. Yeah. It's not built into nope. the graphite. Nope. And we also, well, to, to some extent, we have uh, alarms based on this. Since this is al also has an HTTP API, we can easily write sensor checks that checks uh, the data in graphite when it comes from sources that we can't really uh, tap into using sensor itself. So we have that information sent into graphite and we can then tap into graphite and collect that information. Uh, it sounds like you are storing the same data three times for me. You okay. have the, the sensu that gets data from the different checks. That could be checks that check uh, CPU usage and yeah. stuff like that. Then you store that in sensu. Nope. Then you have, okay, <laughs> but you could store that. Nope. Okay, what does sensu do? It's just for alarming. Nope. <laughs> Let's go back to this one. Uh, the inf let's say uh, this information here, uh, whether it's warning or critical or whatever, that gets sent into Redis. But the information that you have regarding uh, metrics, when you, not a check, but a metric, um, where the information which gets routed into here, it looks a little bit different and uh, it has been tagged as a metric, then that information will, uh, well the status of it, did, was the check performed, did it go well and so on, that will be sent to Redis, but the information itself about uh, the number of CPU cycles or the, percent memory used or something, that won't be stored here. That will be sent off to graphite. So it, it shouldn't be stored more than once, I hope. Um, and as soon as a message has been handled or consumed from the queue here, it's, it's gone. Oops. And more questions about metrics? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, <laughs> I have one, one question about the... Uh, go back one slide. Yep. Uh, that command that you, that you um, execute, yep. uh, that gets authorized because you use LDAP? No, that no. doesn't get authorized. Okay. So you can send that command to the Graphite server without authorization? Yeah. Okay. You, you have to configure your firewalls. <laughs> no, uh, Graphite, uh, in all its simplicity, uh, doesn't have authorization in that matter or in that regard. So as long as you can talk to port 2003 on the Graphite so server, you can um, pop st stuff in there. But all of this is on our internal network, so hopefully <laughs> no one unauthorized should be able to do so. Uh, and if someone can, then I have to go and do my job <laughs> again. Yeah, do you have to pre-configure the retention for a specific server? Mm. Or if I send in the value for an unknown server, will it create the files? No, you you use kind of a, a wild card. So you say, let's say in, in, in we have like before this here, maybe we, we use sensor for all sensor metrics. So then we have sensor, sensor dot server name dot metric. 
and uh, then we have everything that starts with sensu dot something uses a certain retention. Uh, and if it's something from one of our internal applications that has some other kind of first first category or whatever you want to call it, which has a different retention value. Uh, so you, you, you can specify the retention values on uh, a number of different levels and you, you also have a default retention value, which is used if, if it doesn't match any of the retention Any other questions? Not yet. Okay. Nope. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, Marcus, for coming. And uh, we have a little gift. Uh, hopefully, you don't have these already. <laughs> yeah, been here sometimes before. <laughs> I've grabbed no. some candy also because you love those. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we will have a little discussion afterwards, as we usually have. But just, just for the students who are attending the course, yeah, the other ones who are here can, can stay here also. But we use Discord as usual. So with that said, this was the last lecture for this course. Uh, I hope you know what to do now. Uh, quite a lot of, for you to do with the examination uh, assignment being published. So I think we will end it with that. Thank you. Thank you.